Henrietta Sieberling by Bob Kay. Bill Wilson was having some panicky moments in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel in the early afternoon of the second Saturday of May, 1935. Much has been made of his hot flash spiritual experience of five months earlier at the town's hospital, but at least equally important was his theory that attempts made to reach out and help others could keep him sober. Away from home and from his sources of struggling alcoholics, the Calvary Mission and Towns Hospital, how could he possibly find someone who might embrace his new and only partially developed ideas? He was in Akron, engaged in a proxy battle that, if successful, would provide him with an executive position and the opportunity to rise up from his current indignity of being a man supported by his wife. The venture was not going as well as hoped, and his colleagues returned to New York. Bill was left to make continued efforts on behalf of a cause that was most probably lost. His associates gone, he was alone and felt the lure of the cocktail lounge. God, he thought, I am going to get drunk. See, Not God by Ernest Kurtz, page 27. But he knew already what he would write a few years later. When all other measures failed, work with another alcoholic would save the day. Big book, page 15. Lest we miss the point that this one thing surpasses all others in providing protection from relapse. Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. Big Book, page 89. Better even than prayer, white lights a-flashin', or cool winds a-blowin'. In the hotel lobby was a display with the names and phone numbers of various ministers. Bill called Reverend Tonks, an Oxford Group affiliate. The clergyman supplied a list of contacts, which included Norman Shepard, who supplied the name of Henrietta Sieberling, who was desperately trying to bring a religious cure to a rapidly declining local physician. Bill's recognition of the Sieberling name made him timid about calling who he presumed to be the wife of the great Akron tire magnate F.A. Sieberling. When he eventually telephoned, he discovered that Henrietta was the daughter-in-law of the man known as the Little Napoleon of the rubber industry. Estranged from her husband, she was living not in the 65-room mansion, Stan Hewitt Hall, but in the estate's gatehouse. Chapter, A Rum Hound and a Potted Plant Henrietta was bent on saving her drunken doctor friend, but she never drank much herself and did not understand his compulsion. Getting Better Inside Alcoholics Anonymous by Nan Robertson, page 32. Bill spoke directly. I'm from the Oxford group, and I'm a rum hound from New York. Her silent reaction, she said, was... This is really manna from heaven. Aloud, she said, you come right out here. See, pass it on, page 137. Ann Smith was forced to decline Henrietta's invitation to come over that night. Dr. Bob was as potted as the plant he had brought home as a gift for the morrow's Mother's Day. A meeting was arranged for the next day. Dr. Bob's reluctant agreement to attend carried the stipulation that I'll give him 15 minutes and that's it, he declared to his wife. See Bill W. by Francis Hardigan, page 81. They stayed six hours more than that. Decades later, on December 6th, 1979, Henrietta's New York Times obituary called her a key figure in the founding and development of Alcoholics Anonymous. Without her brokering of this vital encounter, history most surely would have followed a different path. Chapter Growing Up Henrietta McBrayer Buckler 
was born in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky on March 18, 1888. She was reared in Texas where her father, Julius Augustus Buckner, was a judge. She was well-educated, graduating from Vassar College when she was only 15. She majored in music, courtesy Summit County Historical Society. She was a well-bred Kentuckian, a lifelong seeker of things of the spirit. She had married a son of Frank A. Sieberling, the founder of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, but her husband had abandoned her and their three adolescent children. See Robertson, page 32. At the time of her marriage to J. Frederick Sieberling in 1917, the Goodyear Company had a gross annual sales of $100 million. At the time of the Wilson Smith meeting in her home in 1935, she was 47 years old, snubbed and condescended to by her rich and socially prominent relatives. She had found solace in the Oxford group meetings. See Robertson, page 32. Chapter First Impressions Henrietta was a handsome woman with captivating ways and a magnolia skin who put a brave face on her struggles to survive and raise three children. She was also a bit of a snob. Despite her estrangement from her husband, the Sieberling family had allowed her to stay on in the gatehouse. When the tall, awkward Wilson slouched over her doorstep that Saturday and proceeded to make himself too readily at home, Henrietta was appalled. She found him both vulgar and servile, with a smarmy grin. He was loud and garrulous. She disliked him on sight. He laughed too loudly and showed too many teeth even when talking. He had this mannerism of rubbing his hands together in a simpering smile, a regular Uriah Heap. See Robertson, pages 32 and 33. Chapter, This Bud's For You, Jesus. The so-called First Century Christian Fellowship had been a presence in Akron since 1924. Unlike their peers at New York's Calvary Church, the Akronites had a zeal for the special task of helping alcoholics, a passion that arose from the 1931 conversion of Russell Bud Firestone, scion of tire tycoon Harvey Firestone. Young Firestone was a notorious sot whose drinking had exasperated and mortified his prominent family. See Bill W. and Mr. Wilson by Matthew Raphael, pages 100-101. The grateful paterfamilias sponsored a huge festival for the Oxford group in January of 1933. Buckman himself appeared at the gala. Reverend Turks was among the dignitaries who met him at the train station. Henrietta Sieberling was present at this event, as was Ann Smith. Dr. Bob was not. Though the drinking problem was not mentioned in newspaper accounts, Bud and his grateful wife were fearless in their sharing at the banquet and rally. I gave my life to Jesus Christ, Firestone told some of the nearly 2,000 people in Polsky's auditorium. See New Wine by Mel B., page 67. Shortly after the Mammoth Rally, Dr. Bob Smith would be dragged to Oxford group gatherings by his increasingly impatient spouse. About the time of the beer experiment, I was thrown in with a crowd of people who attracted me because of their seeming poise, health, and happiness. I sensed they had something I did not have from which I might readily profit. I learned that it was something of a spiritual nature, which did not appeal to me very much, but I thought it could do no harm. I gave the matter much time and study over the next two and a half years, but still got tight each night nevertheless. Big Book, page 178. Chapter on a Mission from God Sometime in late 1932, Delphine Weber, a friend of the Smiths, called Henrietta Sieberling to urge that something has to be done about Dr. Smith, 
is drinking, you know. Henrietta had not known. See Not God, page 31. Although Ann Smith was persuaded to bring her husband to Oxford group meetings, although Ann Smith was persuaded to bring her husband to the Oxford group meetings, the taciturn Vermonter remained what would be called in the modern AA world, walled up. Over time, Henrietta grew closer to the Smiths, but there was no change in the doctor's drinking. She arranged in the spring of 1935 a small meeting where other members bared their souls by sharing something costly to them. The strategy worked, and Dr. Bob confessed that he was a secret drinker. From then on, said Dorothy, Henrietta's daughter, that was a major concern. How to help him? No one knew anything about the problem. See Robertson, page 53. The timely arrival of Bill Wilson, loutish as she may have perceived him to be, was seen as divine providence. Chapter The Portage Country Club Henrietta Sieberling arranged for Bill to move from the Mayflower Hotel to the Portage Country Club, Akron's finest. The club was just down the road from the Sieberling estate, and it also put Bill closer to the Smiths. Officially, he was the guest of club member John Gameter, a self-made man with whom Bill felt himself to have a lot in common. Bill golfed at this club throughout his stay in Akron. See Hardigan, page 83. Wife Lois was less than impressed with her unemployed husband's hobnobbing with the wealthy. There didn't seem to be very much happening in the proxy fight, and I can't say I liked thinking about his playing golf at this fancy country club while I was working at Lousers. See Hardigan, page 83. After a couple of weeks, Bill moved in with the Smiths and stayed until the end of August. Years later, Wilson looked fondly back on the summer of 1935 as the period in which Anne and Henrietta provided him and Dr. Bob with their infusion of spirituality. See Not God, page 40. In addition, they readily accepted the generous invitation of T. Henry and Clarence Williams to bring whatever alcoholics they could to a regular Wednesday Oxford group meeting at the Williams home, a meeting which had its origin largely in Henrietta Sieberling's much earlier effort to do something for Dr. Bob. See Not God, page 40. Henrietta was involved that summer on almost a daily basis and always counted herself, along with Ann Smith, Bob, and Bill, as one of the four co-founders. From her perspective, the true origin of AA lay not in faraway events in New York or even in Wilson's crisis in the Mayflower lobby, but rather in the Oxford group's prior conversion of Dr. Smith. See Raphael, page 106. Chapter, Not Religious Enough. Many find Alcoholics Anonymous to be religious, overly religious. From Henrietta Sieberling's perspective, the greater danger came from a conflicting source, a creeping secularism. She reacted adversely to a couple of speakers who were more psychology than grace of God. Bob and Bill said to me, Henrietta, I don't think we should talk too much about religion or God. I said to them, well, we're not out to please the alcoholics. They've been pleasing themselves all these years. We are out to please God. And if you don't talk about what God does and your faith and your guidance, then you might as well be the Rotary Club or something like that, because God is your only source of power. Credit 1971 interview with John Sieberling. In the autumn of 1939, Clarence Williams complained to Sieberling about the alcoholic's abuse of her home and of the Oxford group tenants. The OG folks thought that the big book was commercial and likely were not fans of the deluded spirituality of God as we understood him. 
October 1939 saw the final split from the Oxfordists. Cleveland had seceded six months earlier. Henrietta told Dr. Bob that it, the split, was the worst mistake he had ever made. How could you do this? You'll be sorry. See Old Timers, page 218. Henrietta later returned with the AA folks, but she was not active long in Akron as she moved to New York. Chapter Opposing the AA Conference Bill Wilson led a campaign in the late 40s to turn over AA's leadership to the groups. Sieberling was vehemently antagonistic to this plan. Sieberling's campaign against the conference system of representation included charging Bill with having taken complete leave of his senses. See Hartigan, page 188. Her private communications were even more strongly stated as, quote, H.S. equates Wilson with the devil come to destroy A.A. See Not God, page 355. Bill did not hold a grudge, and the two saw a great deal of each other in New York. From 1944 and on, she spent time in both New York City and Akron. Henrietta outlived Bill Wilson, passing in 1979 at the age of 91. About the author, Bob Kay. Bob Kay lives in the metropolitan Toronto area and has been a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous for 24 years and an out-of-the-closet atheist for that entire time. He has been a regular contributor to the AA Agnostica website for almost five years and in January 2015 published Key Players in AA History. In 2013, he co-founded the Whitby Freethinkers Meeting. The original print version of this story, Henrietta Sieberling by Bob Kay, may be found on the website aabelief.com in the AA History section dated March 2, 2016. This audio version was produced on January 23, 2017. This and many other stories and podcasts may also be found on our YouTube site and SoundCloud. Just look up AA Beyond.